When Rob and I settled on the theme of the press and the presidency, I knew right away whom I wanted to invite to give historical context to the subject. Not because he had written or edited over 50 books on Lincoln, and if, if I check the internet today, it's probably over 60. Not because he received honors from President Bill Clinton and President George W. Bush for his expertise on Lincoln and not because he won the Mark Linton History Prize from the Columbia University School of Journalism, but because last year I was privileged to chair a committee that recommended six outstanding books for consideration for the prestigious Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. And our speaker's book, Lincoln and the Power of the Press, The War for Public Opinion, was among the finalists and deservedly won the $50,000 prize and a pretty cool bust of Lincoln. I just want the bust. <laughs> Always a bridesmaid. That book is nothing less than the definitive chronicle of Lincoln's rise in politics as it paralleled the rise of the press as a key shaper of public opinion and public policy. Harold Holzer's current day job is directing the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College in Manhattan. Previously, he was Senior Vice President for Public Affairs for the Metropolitan Museum of Art where he had served for over 20 years. So I'm guessing in New York that makes you a made man. <laughs> Almost. Almost, wow, tough crowd. You have more details about his achievements and publications in your packet, so let me just recount one story about Lincoln and the press as an, uh, as an introduction to our speaker and topic. Lincoln's longtime law partner, William Herndon, once wrote that Lincoln, quote, never overlooked a newspaper man who had it in his power to say a good or bad thing of him, end quote. He then recounted a story of Lincoln writing a small town newspaper editor, saying, hey, I've been reading your paper for years without paying for it. Remember, Lincoln used to be a postmaster, so he read everything. He then enclosed $10 and added, put it in your pocket, say nothing further about it. You can tell where this is going. Not long after, Lincoln mails the editor an op-ed he had penned, asking him to run it in the editorial column of the country paper. The editor declined, <laughs> writing Lincoln, saying, I long ago made it a, a, a rule to publish nothing as editorial matter not written by myself. So out 10 bucks, Lincoln took the matter lightly and said to Herndon, that editor has a rather lofty but proper conception of true journalism. Please welcome a leading light of all things Lincoln, someone who helped me at various stages of my own career as a Lincoln scholar and a man I'm proud to call my friend, Harold Holzer. Thank you, Lucas. It's great to be here. Um, um, I was here at, at Washington and Lee and VMI for a joint appearance. I can't remember whether it was 1987 or 1988. And I was such a hit that I was told that I would definitely be invited back. So <laughs> 29 years later, <laughs> Lucas, who was a child at the time, <laughs> has made good on this, on this promise. So it's wonderful to be in this beautiful town at this gorgeous college and to see all of you. I have the unenviable spot um, of following Carl Bernstein with a talk. That's not easy to do because that was a brilliant talk, inspiring one yesterday. But it gave me an opportunity to, um, to sort of key off of his high-minded expectations of journalists investigatory and otherwise in a disappearing press culture. I want to recalibrate our thoughts to the press culture of the Civil War era, um, which was pretty different. And Lucas gave a good example of it um, and opened the door for me to talk a little bit about the press culture as it existed before I uh, launch into the main theme of the day, which is what Lincoln did to control the press during the Civil War, which is a great deal. And um, things that are very hard to fathom 
uh, in today's freedom of the press conscious um, post Pentagon Papers era. So Abraham Lincoln came of age in an era of partisan journalism. Um, the newspapers he read as a child, and I know all the romanticized stories you've heard about Lincoln reading the Bible and Shakespeare at home by the firelight, and he did, but he also read newspapers. And there are plenty of accounts from relatives and visitors of him as a young man assuming that position he loved to assume by the fireplace, which is turning a chair upside down and leaning his back against the bottom of the chair and curling up his legs and reading by the firelight. And they recalled his reading these big broadsheet newspapers. His mother, who, his stepmother, who could barely read, um, remembered his reading the St. Louis papers, specifically. And this is as a teenager. Um, they, the paper he read, the St. Louis Democrat, was, despite the name, a Whig newspaper. The St. Louis Republican was a Democratic newspaper. It's very complicated. <laughs> it's just meant to confuse you, maybe. He read it religiously and even contributed a few pieces, one on temperance, lost to us, sadly. But by the time he gets to New Salem, and Lucas mentioned that he was a postmaster, interestingly, an anti-Jackson man appointed by the Jackson administration because nobody else wanted to be the village postmaster of New Salem. Lincoln wanted to be. He had very little else to do with them at that time. And what's more, among the mail that came in for distribution, well, not for distribution, for separation. Mail wasn't delivered in those days. People came in to whatever the post office was, usually um, a, a grocery store or something like that, to pick up their mail. And, and the subscribers to out-of-town newspapers, which were relatively inexpensive to mail in those days, unlike first-class letters, um, they, they soon found that their newspapers were not arriving in the crisp condition that they were used to. They were open, clumsily refolded, and then they began to understand that Abraham Lincoln was consuming these newspapers, and they sort of thought it was amusing. Um, I have to just do one side story, because it always fascinates me, about this newspaper culture. Most newspaper earnings in those days came from subscriptions from mail subscriptions. There was so much migration in the country that people wanted to read their old hometown newspapers to keep up with the doings in the places that they had left. Um, and it was so prohibitively expensive to send what we call first class letters in those days. I don't remember the figures, but much more than newspapers. And what's more, the, the person who received the letter had to pay the first class postage, which put a rather unfair burden on your <laughs> correspondent. So people began writing their letters on, in the newspapers and remailing newspapers, which were much cheaper. Well, Congress in those days, unlike the Congress that Carl described yesterday, actually did things, not always wisely. So in this case, they got together and said, we're going to ban letter writing in newspapers. I don't know how you enforce that. So they banned it. So what, what subscribers began to do is send messages acrostically by circling letters of the words in the, anyway, this went on for 20 years before it became affordable to send routine letters. The more important thing, the serious thing, is that beginning with the Jackson administration, uh, administrations had official newspapers in Washington functioning as a press secretary and a press office would today. They got the stories first, they published them widely, they arranged um, uh, syndicate services to pick up the official government line. Opposition papers existed to criticize everything that was being put out by the administration. And they were angry at the opposition newspaper because the, the official newspaper not only got the scoops, they got government printing contracts galore and in many cases got the opportunity to do the official records of Congress. These are the days um, before, in fact, government printing office did not begin officially doing the congressional record, as we call it today, until the Lincoln administration. It was a plum patronage assignment. So this uh, deepening partisanship among newspapers 
grew and grew and grew through the Mexican War and on through the Civil War era. You were known in your town by the newspaper you carried under your arm. If you were in New York City and you carried the New York Tribune under your arm, people knew you were an anti-slavery Whig, later a Republican. If you carried <coughs> the New York Herald, you were likely a Democrat, you were conservative, you didn't care much about the slavery issue, you basically wanted it to go away <coughs> and be settled elsewhere. <clears throat> Even the small towns of, the, of America had two newspapers. And a British visitor, I relate this in my book, a British visitor who happened upon an event in a Midwestern town in the 1840s said that the event was totally unrecognizable from the reports he read the following morning. <laughs> a, a huge success in one uh, venue in one newspaper, a, a tragic uh, um, mess in the other. I told um, a story at dinner yesterday, I'll repeat it um, with apologies for those who were sitting with me yesterday. After the first Lincoln deba Douglas debate in 1858, uh, Lincoln's uh, friends carried him off on their shoulders, which was not an easy thing to do. He was a big fellow with long legs and some people <clears throat> parenthetically noticed that he was wearing a union suit underneath so that his long underwear was showing when his pants rode up. But the, um, the Republican newspaper wrote, after Lincoln's triumphant um, uh, debate performance, his supporters carried him off in celebration to another event. The Democratic newspaper wrote that Lincoln had been so exhausted by Stephen Douglas's attacks that his supporters had to carry him off. And that's a anecdotally what it was like to read the press, but usually much, much more personal, vicious, it was political, it was personal, and it's almost difficult to believe how people moved politically from one point to another if all they read is their partisan paper. If all you watch is MSNBC or all you watch is Fox, you're not going to get a very broad view of what's going on. And that's the way it was in the print business. But there was one more element that's crucial to remember. And that is this intersection between press and politics and government. Not only that Jackson and succeeding administrations, even Lincoln, although it was less important, had an official newspaper that got government contracts, but that so many politicians became journalists, and so many journalists wanted to be politicians and often were. And they did both jobs simultaneously, and it was not considered improper. I'll just do a few case studies from, from New York City, which is the, my city and the, and the town that I concentrated on for the most part in, in my book, because so many New York papers were circulated west and south in national editions and, and overnight uh, editions to other cities. Horace Greeley, very famous editor, one of the most famous 19th century journalists, famous for saying, go west, young man, etc., cetera, um, was an enormously successful newspaper publisher. But it was never enough for him. He yearned to be a political force. He ran for lieutenant governor of New York and lost. He ran for the Senate when William Seward left the Senate to join the Lincoln administration as Secretary of State. Greeley ran for his seat. It was a legislative election, as they all were in the 19th century. And ironically, Greeley was in Springfield, Illinois, visiting President-elect Lincoln when the votes were cast, of course, <coughs> after being, going back and forth on ballot after ballot after ballot, yes, it was an open and contested vote. Um, he lost, he lost. He, he was so angry at not getting the rewards that he wanted that he very publicly dissolved his, quote, partnership in the firm of Greeley, Seward, and Weed, Weed being the very successful publisher of an Albany newspaper, who also happened to be a political boss. Greeley served in one political role. 
He was appointed to a congr an unexpired congressional term from New York City in the late 1840s and got to serve 10 months with Abraham Lincoln in his only congressional term. And he wrote le later, I never saw anything particularly special about him. I never heard him tell a joke, which means that he really didn't spend much time with him because everybody else would go to the house post office to hear him tell stories and knew about that. And he said, if I would have picked out five or six Western men, I would have uh, thought might be a future president, I never would have picked Lincoln. Um, Frank, they never got along. It's one of the great losses for Greeley and Lincoln that they had such a disputatious relationship, which we could talk about further in the question and answer period. Um, as you may know, Greeley later ran for president in one of the, I mean, he was the, he was the George McGovern of, uh, of 100 years earlier. He ran against Ulysses S. Grant seeking his second term. And it was not an easy thing to do. Still the only candidate who ever died before the votes were counted because technically he, uh, the Electoral College processed its votes after Greeley had already died. Um, they had a very tough relationship. Um, but they were very interconnected, and Greeley was never happy. And he was especially unhappy and jealous because his managing editor, a young man named Henry Jarvis Raymond, who, whom he paid terribly and finally lost as an employee, only to see him get funded by Thurlow Weed to start a rival Republican Whig, later Republican paper in New York, called the New York Times. <laughs> And be he became successful. But Raymond had the magic touch. Raymond was elected lieutenant governor. Raymond was elected to the assembly of New York State. As soon as Henry Raymond got to Albany, one year later, he was elected speaker of the New York State Assembly. Greeley was seething. I, I will skip ahead to say in 1864, Henry Raymond hit the trifecta. And by the way, Greeley wrote dispatches from Washington while serving in the House. Again, no conflicts of interest perceived. In 1864, the year that Abraham Lincoln ran for re-election, Henry Raymond served as editor of the New York Times, chairman of the Republican National Committee, and a candidate for Congress from Manhattan. An election, of course, he won. <laughs> and he wrote a thick book of Lincoln's uh, annotated version of Lincoln's speeches that became a bestseller in 1864. In other words, he was, he was the media man. He was doing the messaging for Lincoln. He and Greeley later thought Lincoln would lose, but again, that's another story. So that's the interconnection. One more guy I, I'll, I'll tell you about, uh, a man named John Wien Forney nowhere near as famous as Greeley or Raymond. He was the editor of a Democratic paper in Philadelphia, but he wanted to be a power in Washington. And he was, because he was the editor of a very important Democratic paper in a swing state of sorts. Uh, they didn't call them then, that then, but it was. So he was given a great job, clerk of the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, in 1860, the, the House and Senate turned. It's easy to see a Congress go to the, another party if so many people of your party secede and go to another country, <laughs> became Republican. And Forney was desperate. He liked that job. He liked the money. He liked the influence. So he went to the Lincoln administration and he said, you know, I would like to be loyal to you. I am now the editor of a Republican paper in Philadelphia. It's uh, just easy, we just change the editorial viewpoint. So Lincoln campaigned for him to become Secretary of the U.S. Senate, a job he got and held throughout the Civil War. He then founded a sister paper in Washington called the Sunday Chronicle, later made it a daily paper, and it became a major mouthpiece for Lincoln because they would publish his view of the world in both Philadelphia and Washington at the same time. And he held on to this patronage post. Lincoln called in the new senator from Illinois and said, you ought to support this man. And he recorded it in his diary that the president was lobbying for Forney. All of this crossing back and forth in the open 
typical, very partisan, very political. I will tell you because this is a, um, um, an institute for honor, that I have found very few people who were, um, felt that it was slightly dishonorable to engage so directly in these pursuits. And who do you think that person was? Abraham Lincoln. And this is pre-presidential. But absolutely, Professor Morell is right. Lincoln subscribed to newspapers that were struggling. He visited newspapers on the road. He made the editors his friends, even if they had no time for him at first. He helped launch the Chicago Tribune, which became one of his most passionate supporters, and later rewarded its editor with a huge patronage job of his own uh, when he became president. But Lincoln calculated very cleverly that with everyone rigidly moving, reading their own papers and with Illinois stuck in the Democratic category, the one chance that existed to shift the state, and hopefully he, and I think he perceived himself as the head of the ticket at that point, was through immigration and through immigrants. Germans were flocking into the West in 1858 and 1859. And they were overwhelmingly Republican. Many of them had fled the revolutions of Europe. They were progressive. They, and, and, and by the way, the rules were very simple. You came to this country. You resided here for five years. You then swore that you were no longer, uh, you no longer had an allegiance to your home country. And you became an American citizen and could vote. And Lincoln wanted those people. In 1859, he met a, uh, a man named Theodore Kinesius, who was a, a German immigrant, a physician, and a newspaper editor in southern Illinois. I ran a German progressive newspaper. He approached Lincoln and tried to get Lincoln to support uh, a fight against an anti-immigration measure that was coming from, of all places, Massachusetts. Lincoln wrote a letter in sympathy. It was published in the Daily Press. And then Dr. Kinesius told Lincoln he was going to start a German language newspaper in Springfield. And Lincoln immediately realized that this might be a very useful tool if he became buddies with Dr. Kinesius. And the doctor said, well, I have one problem, and that is I'm bankrupt, and my printing press is in hock. I need $500 to start this paper. So Lincoln went to the Republican State Committee and said, we ought to give this guy $500. And, and, and the head of the State Committee said, and this is in writing, Dr. Kinesius is a leech. If you give him money, he will ask for more money. So lawyer Lincoln got himself as a client. I know lawyers here will think it's not a good idea to represent yourself. And he wrote a contract that was hidden from view for decades. The contract stipulated that he would give Dr. Kinesius $500 and be de facto owner, publisher of this new newspaper. All Dr. Kinesius had to do is promise that he would never, in his reporting and his editorials, never shift from Republican platform policy from either the state or the federal or the national Republican Party. If he did that for one year, ending Coincidentally, after Election Day 1860, <laughs> Dr. Kinesius could own the press, the types, as they called them, meaning the hard type that was used to set type, and could, all the money that was raised would be him, would be Dr. Kinesius. Lincoln didn't want any money. Lincoln was not open about it. He never was identified in the paper. Nor could he read the paper, by the way. He didn't read German. He did try to take a German class once in Springfield, but according to one of the survivors of that class, his presence made it impossible to learn anything because he told stories throughout the class. <laughs> Great Lincoln story. So Lincoln had to depend on the kindness of German-speaking friends to guarantee that the paper continued to express fealty to the Republican policies, which it did, because the English language, Springfield paper said, Mr. Lincoln has won the presidency. We owe a great deal to Dr. Kinesis and his German paper. Illinois voted Republican. 
Indiana voted Republican. Lincoln wrote these little letters to people saying, I just heard of this new newspaper, this German newspaper. You ought to subscribe and get people to do it. But he re it really only his banker knew. Um, presumably his wife knew. She was not a fan of all the newspapers that she says she couldn't open her door in the morning because there were so many newspapers thrown <laughs> against the door. Um, in 1861, Lincoln signed over the paper to Dr. Canisius. That contract exists in the, uh, at the John Hay Library at Brown University. Lincoln's version of the contract, which doesn't have the endorsement because it didn't require it, is in the Abraham Lincoln uh, Presidential Library and Museum collection. But in 1861, Lincoln, he's president elects actually December 1860, signed it over to Dr. Canisius. And in the midst of appointing many German editors to diplomatic posts in Europe, made Dr. Canisius consul to Vienna at $1,500 a year, which was not a bad job. The rewards for editors who were loyal piled up, their loyalty ensured forever. And then in one final gesture, Lincoln convinced gesture, Lincoln convinced the state legislature to buy all existing copies of the Staatsanziger, as it was called, for no particular reason. I mean, very few of them spoke German. But it produced another $1,000 for Dr. Canisius to have his pocket change. It buys a lot of sauerbraten in, uh, in wow. Vienna in, in 1861. Uh, interestingly, by that gesture and by buying up all the papers, which I think were then discarded rather than distributed. We don't have a single copy of the Staatsanziger anywhere on earth. Not one copy of Abraham Lincoln's newspaper has survived. And they've looked throughout Illinois and they've put out the word. And anyway, um, our mutual friend Jonathan White, who teaches in uh, Newport News, is constantly on eBay looking for a copy of this newspaper. Obviously, the, the P fever pitch of partisan journalism occurred in the election of 1860. Um, Democratic newspapers assailing Lincoln, Republican newspapers praising him. Lincoln did not campaign on his own. It was not traditional to do so in that period. Stephen Douglas, in order to campaign, made up this fantastic story that his mother was ill in New England and therefore he had to go see her. Um, and, and it seemed to him that the most logical way to get from uh, Chicago to Vermont was to go south to New Orleans, then go this way, and then go that way uh, on a train that stopped at every town so he could orate while the, it was being refueled and new water was added. And he was criticized for it. Uh, it was just not done. So Abraham Lincoln becomes president-elect. And what happens is, um, Partisan journalism continues, but it changes on two occasions into something different, at least in the perception of Abraham Lincoln and the administration. After Fort Sumter, that's the first change, the American flag is fired upon. It falls to the ground. It has to be re-hoisted, jerry-rigged. It is struck again, and it falls down. And the outburst of emotion that occurs in the North is so strong that any newspaper in New York City that doesn't fly a flag is mobbed. And I mean mobbed, I mean it in the 19th century term. Mobs circulate there and are prepared to attack, burn the newspaper. The New York Herald, the Democratic paper run by James Gordon Bennett, he said, probably, I'm not responding to this, although he was you know, as offended at, by the attack as the other editors. But when a mob gathered in the rain outside his building, um, suddenly a newsboy could be seen running through the streets and then running back with something under his arm. And then two minutes later, a flag was hoisted um, was, was hung out of a window on the upper floor. So the disappointed mob m marched off to the ferries to go to Brooklyn because they heard that the Brooklyn Eagle, a Democratic paper, had not flown the flag. So that's the first, the first 
reminder that, um, that there is going to be a different set of standards. When Ephraim Elmer Ellsworth, Lincoln's law student, marches into Alexandria, is killed trying to take down a Confederate flag, quite a, an interesting parallel event, the Union, uh, Union forces who occupy Alexandria soon after his martyrdom closed the Alexandria Gazette because they protested against the Union, quote, invasion of the other side of the Potomac River. Um, the editor simply started a new newspaper, but the new newspaper was shut down by Union forces as well. But the really serious event that changed um, this relationship between politics, government, and the press was the Battle of Bull Run. The Battle of Bull Run was a humiliation for the Union, and it coincided with the end of the first enlistment period for Union forces, which was a real danger to the federal government because it meant that the war was going to be much longer than expected and that there were no men, technically, to fight the war because they were all going home in a very angry mood, I might add. Um, when Democratic newspapers began advising, don't enlist, let the South go. What is the point of shedding more blood and suffering more disgrace? Union forces began reacting in a different way. There was a paper in Philadelphia called The Christian Observer that published a piece saying that Union forces in the Manassas area had been guilty of gross, brutal, fiendish, demonic outrages. Meant to ravage the country, pillage the houses, outrage the women, and shoot children for amusement. Obviously hysterical, but enough for Union forces to march in confiscate the printing press, throw the editor out, with no particular specific cause of action or warrant, and it was tolerated. There was no hue and cry when other Philadelphia papers protested they were shut down. The editor wrote to Lincoln saying, freedom of the press I've always believed was one of the great bulwarks of our national safety. Lincoln ignored the letter. The editor relo relocated in Richmond. In New York City, around this time, a federal grand jury recommended that newspapers, in the frequent practice of encouraging the rebels, now in arms against the federal government, suffer the employment of force to overcome them. The Brooklyn Eagle the pro-slavery or certainly uh, white supremacist Freeman's Journal, the New York Daily News, not the same as today's New York Daily News, for those of you who may know New York City tabloids, but a typical political operation. It was owned by the brother of the mayor of the city of New York, who was not only a Democrat, but was arguing that New York so should secede from the Union to maintain its, its ship uh, relate, you know, it's um, C relationship with the South. The judges in the case never ruled, but some of the newspapers were shut down by federal troops. The Daily News was turned away at the post office from sending newspapers south. When they tried to send newspapers by train, federal troops simply went on the trains and confiscated the newspapers. The Brooklyn Eagle recanted threw out its editor, hired an editor who declared that they were loyal to the union and to the idea of recruitment. This was all about recruitment. Meanwhile, mobs attacked, and I am convinced that these mobs included returning soldiers who were angry at being portrayed as having blown their one opportunity to save the union bloodlessly or quickly. In such non-southern venues as Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, Bangor, Maine, a mob tarred and feathered an editor in Haverhill, Massachusetts and forced him to beg for mercy and recant anti-recruitment policies and closed the paper. By 1862, the new Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, relocated the telegraph office to his library and began official censorship of all 
military news. It all had to run through his office. I know, for those of you who've seen the movie Lincoln, it's very romanticized that Lincoln goes to a telegraph office and puts his feet up and tells stories, and all that is true, but it's in the chilling atmosphere of the War Department Library, where news is censored by people whose title is, are, titles are official censor. <laughs> And that's what they do. Henry Raymond covered the Battle of Bull Run by himself. Imagine the editor of the New York Times as a war correspondent. He had a runner and a horse to carry the news back to Washington so it could be telegraphed to, to, uh, to New York. So he could be the first with the news. And he, and he filed a dispatch that said, glorious news, Union troops on the advance, war to be suppressed, uh, rebellion to end. He got his runner, the runner raced off to Washington, the report arrived, it was filed, it appeared in the paper. And then as Henry Raymond is glo glorying in his scoop, he notices that the troops are retreating over him. <laughs> what happened? There was a counterattack in the afternoon. Well, I've got to write a new story. Who would like to go to Washington? Nobody would like to go to Washington. Henry Raymond had to walk or ride with, with the troops back to Washington in the July heat. He arrives in a state of exhaustion and fear about what his readers are, are hearing, and he sent, gives the, the telegraph operator the new story. Union routed in late afternoon counterattack, and the guy looks at it, and I'm making up the dialogue, but it's what happened, and says, well, this isn't a very nice story. I don't think we should send this over the wires, and Raymond says, what are you talking about? Well, he hands it back to him. Raymond has to take a train to New York. He doesn't get there for another 14 hours, until, so two, two or three days passed before people who only read the New York Times heard that there was a Union defeat at the Battle of Bull Run. Censorship. Now in the border slave states, which were always teetering on the edge of secession, there was even more rampant censorship. Um, in Maryland, let's start with Maryland, the Baltimore Exchange editorialized that the War of the South is a war of the people supported by the people. I wonder if Lincoln read that specifically, of the people, by the people. Had a certain ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> While the war of the North was the war of a party carried out by political schemers. Military authorities shut down the paper, arrested its editor, whose name was Francis Key Howard, and imprisoned him at Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. Has anybody detected what the special irony of that arrest was? Anybody know? It's Francis Scott Key's grandson. And he's in the, in the fort as a prisoner in the place that inspired his grandfather to write the national anthem. Um, not the only case in Maryland. In Missouri, General John Fremont arrested the editor of the St. Louis Journal a rising commander there built his reputation by closing down an obscure pro-secession paper called the Boonville Patriot. And we have his order, bring all the printing material type with you and arrest the editor. The officer's name was Ulysses S. Grant. Grant later, of course, ordered Sherman, who needed no encouragement to hate the press, he hated journalists, to arrest the Memphis correspondent of the Chicago Times. And on and on it went in Missouri. And Sherman, of course, I mean, he, uh, he cracked down on the press without much um, interference by the civilian authorities until he put one of his journalists on one of his uh, military correspondents uh, on, in, in a court-martial and had him tried for a capital offense. Lincoln finally had to ask Grant to maybe Tell them that this is not the wisest course. Um, Kentucky. Lincoln said he would like to have God on his side, but he must absolutely have Kentucky on his side. <laughs> um, the army um, edited the, uh, well, let me read one letter, uh, a letter written to, to Lincoln and Seward. Isn't it about time that the editors of the Louisville Courier were occupants of Fort Lafayette? or some other suitable place for traitors. The people are getting tired of sending their sons to fight rebels, while such as this editor, more mischievous than if armed with muskets, are allowed to furnish aid and comfort to the enemy unmolested. The editor was arrested. He was sent all the way to New York to Fort Lafayette. 
for 14 weeks without habeas corpus, without trial, even military trial, and was only released when he signed a loyalty oath promising never to write disobliging anti-union, anti-government editorials again. I mean, what is Lincoln's explanation? His hand is not directly on any of this, but as he puts it, um, later when he's criticized in New York State, um, must the government be, be so weak that its, that its liberties are more important than the government itself? Or as he quaintly put it, uh, a good doctor would always sacrifice a leg to save a body, but you would never allow the body to be killed to save the leg. That didn't convince the dissidents. But there was never an outcry by Republican journalists. Horace Greeley tried to assemble a group of journalists to try to create a code of ethics on what was appropriate to write and what wasn't, and they sent the code to Lincoln and he ignored it. But of course, Greeley was so unpopular with Raymond and others that nobody, the big guys didn't go to this big summit meeting. Weekly papers went, and so Lincoln was able to ignore it. Uh, and, and these cases continued. In 1863, General Burnside closed down the Chicago Times, which must have given Lincoln a lot of pleasure since they had spent years attacking him in Illinois and during his presidency. It was eventually overturned. But the editor's crime was criticizing General Burnside for arresting a former congressman from Ohio and having him tried by a military tribunal for orating against the draft Clement Vallandigham was sent to the South um, as, a, as, a, as a penalty. Lincoln finally ordered it overturned, but was never convinced he should have. His hand is only on one case directly, but it's the show trial. It's the big one. And that is something that happened in June 1864, when a messenger arrived at all of the newspapers in New York with a new presidential proclamation. Now these arrived routinely throughout the war on a tissue-like paper that was sort of the, um, the 19th century equivalent of carbon paper. And I realized that if I am going to keep talking about this era, I'm going to have to explain what carbon paper is. But I think this crowd, <laughs> this crowd knows what carbon paper is. So the proclamation says the Lincoln administration is very upset about how badly General Grant is doing in Virginia and is going to ask for 400,000 new enrollees or draftees and pray for somehow for the Union to do better in Virginia. Well, this proclamation arrives very late at night, one in the morning in some cases. And most editors look at it and say, you know, this is odd. You know, the criticism of the Union army Maybe we should check it out and not stop the presses. Two newspapers <coughs> did stop the presses. One of them was the New York World, which was a virulently anti-Lincoln, anti-Republican, anti-administration, anti-war paper, anti-emancipation, anti-draft. They ran the proclamation. The next day, <coughs> Abraham Lincoln signed an order arresting editor Manton Marble and closing down the New York World and one other newspaper. Abraham Lincoln shut down a newspaper. And for years we searched for the reason why of all the things that Democratic newspapers said, this was the tipping point for Lincoln. Well, apparently he was actually writing a proclamation calling for 500, not 400,000 men. And he and Secretary of War Stanton believed that the White House had somehow been infiltrated by Democrats and that they had to clamp it down. They had to clamp down. The New York World was not the only paper impinged on. A wire service was shut down. A syndicate service in Washington, a little two-man syndicate service, one of whose members was a reporter who had written wonderful articles about Lincoln during the interregnum between the election and the inauguration in 1860-61. They were arrested and brought, brought before a, a, a military tribunal, not an official one, but to explain why the story was, was, was carried. Eventually, it was discovered that the person who had created the false proclamation had only one thing in mind, 
and that is to get the story published, to watch as the stock market inevitably fell in response, to buy some stocks at bargain prices, and when the proclamation was proved to be a counterfeit, the market would rebound and he would make a killing. Um, it was as simple as that. He was arrested and thrown in prison along with someone who had helped him. And um, there was never an apology to the New York world. There was never a defense of fellow journalists by the Republican newspapers. Horace Greeley, Henry Raymond, the Chicago Tribune all said, there is no absolute guarantee of freedom of the press. Not in times of rebellion, not in times of threats against the government. The papers who were closed down had no friends, but other papers who, if they expressed sympathy, would be shut down too. So before I end and leave you with the impression that Lincoln was precisely the tyrant he was described as in the Democratic press, who inevitably would be censored for calling him a tyrant, let me say something in defense of Lincoln, and I, I do think it's important. Censorship continued throughout the war. There was one case in Maine that, took, that was still being debated in January and February of 1865, when the war was all but won, and Lincoln was in the last months of his life. He didn't know that, of course, but late. There were two moments, two windows during the Civil War when censorship ended albeit temporarily. One was in the off-year elections of 1862. Even though Lincoln knew that because the emancipation, the preliminary emancipation proclamation had been issued late in September in the midst of a political campaign, knew that he was going to be in political trouble, he did not censor anti-Republican, pro-democratic expression. In the election of 1864, he absolutely restrained. Now things were done, as our, we were talking about our friend Jonathan White from Christopher Newport University. He's done a really good study on um, censorship of soldier voting and so voter expression in army camps, and soldiers were voting en masse for the first time. In fact, Horace Greeley or organized uh, the distribution of New York Tribunes to the troops and the removal of the New York World and other disobliging newspapers, so the troops mostly did not get to read pro-democratic political news. But there was no, the New York World, which had been shut down in June, whose editor had been detained in uh, General John A. Dix's office and wasn't sent to Fort Lafayette only because General Dix couldn't believe the orders that he was getting to have him shipped there. Manton Marble returned with a vengeance, issued vicious editorials about Lincoln, started a rumor and published it every day that Abraham Lincoln had visited the Battle of Antietam in 1862 and asked his aide to sing comic songs while walking among the dead and wounded of that battle, which upset Lincoln so much he actually wrote a letter to the editor for his aide to sign, clearly in his style, and then got it off his chest. And like many of Lincoln's interesting unsent letters, very smart thing to do even when you're emailing. Write it all out and then don't send it because <laughs> you're going to get somebody really upset. Um, the New York world was, went wild with criticism. They affiliated with a publisher to put out a book called Miscegenation about the glories of race mixing. And it was not a serious book. It was meant to inflame people by taking, by arguing for race mixing as a solution to problems. They sent a copy to Lincoln for an endorsement, a blurb, thinking that he might write something and they could use it in the campaign. He was smart enough to file it away and not respond. So then the New York World made an affiliation with a publisher of prints and issued a series of pictures that were designed to show Lincoln as favoring integration. A, one cartoon, he's bowing to an African-American woman, while in the background, Horace Greeley is spooning with an African-American woman. And horror of horrors, in the deep background, there is a white driver driving a carriage with a black couple in the carriage. This is supposed to tell you about the topsy-turvy world of miscegenation if Abraham Lincoln was elected. And that was just one of the cartoons. Lincoln, the Republicans, never interfered. Elections were 
holy weeks, holy periods for Abraham Lincoln. And he said later, to, to when he made a little victory speech at the White House, there were those who said we shouldn't have even had the election, but if we could, were forced to postpone or forego the election, the rebels could already said to have beaten us. So that was sacrosanct. And I think that shows that Lincoln was indeed sincere, that he was willing to sacrifice civil liberties in order to save the Constitution that guaranteed civil liberties. That the, um, the clause that gives you the right to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, ambiguous as it, as it is, about whose responsibility it is, and by that time it had been ratified by Congress several times, was, gave him the leeway to crack down on freedom of the press. It's the only time it ever happened in the history of the American Republic. Lincoln didn't always show malice, uh, uh, sometimes showed malice towards some, including the press. But this was the culmination of a partisan press culture that was so much more vicious than we have today that the next time we see Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders being excoriated or praised lavishly on television, we can say, not as bad as it was in 1860. Thank you. <laughs>
and, and, and let it be known that if Chief Justice Taney, who was sitting in, in Annapolis at the time, tried to interfere with the arrest of John Merriman, that he would arrest Taney. So he's cracking down all over the place. He does not want Washington to be isolated uh, within, a sla within a Confederate state. He does not want the pathway of troops from New England and New York to uh, going to Virginia, where the most of the war is, Eastern War is going to be fought, to be interrupted. You know, the governor of Maryland and, and the mayor of Baltimore come to him and say, you know, it, that was a terrible situation when those troops were attacked in Baltimore. Find another way. We don't want them to come through anymore. And Lincoln said, was really angry. He said, my, my soldiers are not moles. They can't dig under the earth. They're not birds. They can't fly over Maryland. And they're not, they're not fish. They can't swim. So he takes complete the, the, and the, you know, uh, takes control of the telegraph, the political apparatus, and the press. I think Maryland would have seceded, but not just with the newspapers in full volume, but also with the legislature in session. Missouri and Kentucky become contested battlegrounds right away. But you know, the censorship, as you say, it's understandable in a way, though it's hard to predict what really would have happened. Um, in 1864, Maryland votes for Lincoln and uh, for, for president and abolishes slavery before the 13th Amendment is, is, uh, is even uh, passed by Congress. I think, I think they do. And, um, but Link, the administration and the army is cracking down in Indiana. I mean, I found, we knew about the show cases, Chicago, New York, and Maryland, but between my research and some research that was done by several scholars before me and, and published in scholarly journals, I mean, we're up to about 200 cases now, all over the Union. California, I mean, they were fighting, their journals were fighting. Um, in Sacramento and, and San Francisco. So I, no one knows what the outcome would have been had freedom of the press reigned. And, um, and I think New York was a tipping point too. I think there was a real, um, there was a real effort in New York City to find, to create some sort of status that would enable trade to continue with the Confederacy. We found um, documents um, surviving proclamations from the mayor to legislatures of Confederate states asking for recognition as, as an independent city. So Mississippi said, well, that sounds fine to me, but you know, Lincoln wouldn't allow it to happen in New York. Anyway, um, we can envision it happening now, even in a war, obviously during the war in Vietnam, the press somehow abbreviated the war, at least roused a country to reconsider it. But that didn't happen in the Civil War. Any others? Yes? You talked about uh, the, the measures he took to get the German support mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, you know, for his election and so forth. There was a downside to that, wasn't it? He also handed out commands to Germans who knew nothing about military things. And we here close to the Shenandoah Valley, you know, look at Newmarket where uh, Franz Siegel was just a disaster as a commander, You're issuing orders to his troops in German, and they couldn't understand. So there, that has two sides, this uh, German appeal. Well, you know, I think there's been a lot of new scholarship on political and, mil and, and ethnic generals. Um, there's a brand new book about um, the Irish Brigade in New York. Uh, I just reviewed it for the Wall Street Journal, and uh, General Marr, who, who was usually lost, and he was one of the leaders of the, the bloody assaults up uh, in, a, you know, at the Battle of Fredericksburg on Marie's Heights. But I don't know, that's another hard calculus to, to, to analyze retrospectively. Um, so here is Lincoln not wanting the war to be only a Republican war, not wanting it only to be a war of the, of the Republican progressive elites. So first you, you and, and you need bodies to fight. So you get Franz Sigel, who is enormously popular with Germans. They all sang songs, I fight mit Sigel, and they sang it as they were mowed down because he was a terrible general, as you say. <laughs> the, the, my late friend John Y. Simon's favorite was General Schimmelfennig, 
who was a disaster, but he had a great name and everybody knew he was German. Um, same thing with the Irish. You need the Irish to fight because they're largely Democrats. So you've got to have a rallying cry for unionism in New York City and Boston, and that's what Corcoran and Marr did among the Irish. So, you know, eventually they weren't prominent in battles, but they were very useful. Carl Schurz is another one. Um, he was a, a lawyer in Illinois, the, the great advocate for German Americans, and Lincoln um, gave him a diplomatic post in 1861, but Schurz wanted to come back and be a general with no particular training, so he came back and he became a general. And he was a pretty bad general, but the Germans loved him, so they volunteered. He got a park. He got a park where my grandson plays. <laughs> and where our mayor now deigns to live after refusing to move into the mansion there for a long time. We have a panel that will close off uh, the symposium later this afternoon, so if you have other questions, there'll uh, be a time uh, Great. for that. Right now, uh, we'll retire over to the Airlock Commons for a break, and if you have books you'd like signed, uh, they'll be there to do that. Let's reconvene at 10.30 here. Thanks.